Up next, we have Dr. Nathan Archer. Uh, Nathan earned his PhD at the University of Nottingham studying mRNA methylation in metazoans and is now a postdoctoral research fellow in Warwick Integrative Synthetic Biology Department at the University of Warwick. Nathan investigates the mechanisms and statistics of transcriptional re regulation in mammalian cells and how that can be used to inform and improve genetic circuit design. Take it away, Nathan. Hi. So, I think I've Am I taking control over the, the slide? Uh, yeah, you should be good to go. Okay, great. Okay, so, uh, yeah, uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, so I'm, I'm in the Heap and Strike group at the University of Warwick uh, in the Synthetic Biology uh, Center, and we're looking at uh, trying to optimize uh, single-cell RNA sequencing uh, so that we can study transcriptional noise and see if we can improve some of the uh, expression that you want from genetic circuits. So noise in our context is uh, the variation that you see between cells that are genetically identical and con cultured under identical conditions, the so-called non-genetic heterogeneity. Uh, but single cell RNA-seq can also be used to illuminate the connection between the genotype and the phenotype of the cell, see if what the, the genotype suggests the cell should look like is uh, what the actual phenotype um, ends up being. Uh, but of course, the, some of the earlier protocols were used to try and isolate circulating tumor cells uh, in uh, cancer medicine. And, uh, but if you want more information on the applications of single cell RNA-seq, I'd recommend this uh, uh, paper that reviews uh, a lot of the applications for it. But for us, uh, we're using it to study transcriptional noise that we're hoping to use uh, the knowledge um, and the models that we can generate from that to improve genetic uh, circuit design and create some more uh, predictable expression from uh, genetic circuits that we're using uh, in synthetic biology. So to try and just shine a bit more light on what we mean by uh, non-genetic heterogeneity, if you take a, a facts plot of uh, identical cells cultured under identical conditions, you still see quite a, a, a variety of phenotypes. So there we're looking at the forward scatter, which is the, the size of the cell, and you can see that varies, as well as um, a, a construct that we've transfected into the cell uh, expressing GFP, and the expression of that construct also varies, so you get quite a dispersed uh, population. And that can be caused by the stuff that we're interested in, such as transcriptional noise, but also a variety of other uh, sources of noise both biological and non-biological, so the technical noise of the instruments and methods that we're using to measure those uh, parameters. So uh, other possible biological factors include some of the uh, weird and wacky things that go on after transcription, such as nonsense mediated decay, but also transcriptional bursting and uh, the, the way that the uh, nucleus can buffer export and change some of the, how the noise uh, looks in the, once the RNA has reached the cytoplasm. So as a result of all this noise, if you look at a population of cells, you'll see an expected normal distribution of a molecule. But then if you divide it up into various uh, populations, random populations, what you might actually see is that that large normal distribution is actually obscuring uh, a number of smaller multiple distributions, multiple normal distributions. So to try and untangle some of the uh, biological and technical noise, uh, let's quickly go over the single cell RNA-seq workflow. So the first step is isolating the single cells. So that can be with uh, facts or a lot of the earlier methods, if you're crazy, but it seems like a great way of doing it is with mouth petting. But now more and more, it's trying to get higher throughput. So more single cells using microfluidics and oil encapsulation. Then it's lysing the cells and priming the uh, RNA for first and second strand synthesis. And one of the big differences between single cell seq versus uh, tissue RNA sequencing is trying to avoid lossy methods and lossy steps uh, in the protocol. So then we have to reverse transcribe the RNA. Uh, so we use in our lab SmartSeq and we've used a few of the other methods. But then you have to fragment and tag the RNA and we do that with Nextera which varies quite a bit compared to some of the whole tissue uh, methods that you probably use. So to try and understand the biological noise, we need to know which bits of the biological noise we're seeing is actually biological noise and not just technical noise from the methods we're using. 
So technical noise can come from a variety of different uh, parts of the protocols that we're using. So the priming strategy, whether that's random hexamers or priming from the uh, poly A tail, uh, the reverse transcriptase that you're using uh, and how that interacts, uh, the processivity of that enzyme across the, the RNA. Same again with the DNA polymerase for second strand synthesis. And then there's PCR amplification, which has its own biases. Uh, and then there's, there's fragmentation. Usually in uh, whole tissue RNA-seq is followed by end repair. Uh, and then you have to tag it for sequencing. And then there's some more uh, PCR amplification. Uh, in single cell RNA-seq, for example, we combine these into uh, the next era protocol, which is tagmentation, which I'll go into in a bit. Uh, and then more technical noise can potentially come from the sequencing chemistry that you use, which is, uh, so in this case, the next-gen sequencing shotgun uh, approach that you're using from different companies. And then how you actually analyze the data, how you're aligning the transcripts, uh, so bioinformatics can bring its further technical noise, and just the mundane processing steps, um, such as precipitation. Uh, even precipitation can uh, bring in some technical noise. So trying to re uh, reduce these steps is one of the first hurdles to actually being able to work with the tiny quantities of RNA that you get from single cells. And the biggest problem is that the technical noise, as I keep saying, can hide or artificially amplify the actual biological noise that we want to know about. So the the smart uh, way the the smart kit that we're using and the, the smart mechanism is a switching mechanism at the five prime end of the uh, RNA transcript. So this is our standardised uh, messenger RNA molecule. We've got the uh, poly A tail at the three prime end and at the five prime cap of the triphosphate bridge. And so with the smart mechanism, we're usually using a anchored oligo DT to prime the first strand synthesis, and then that's the the enzyme can uh, start that first strand synthesis until it reaches the the five prime end of the transcript, uh, and as it falls off, it adds these untemplated cytosines, which you then target with a template switching oligo. Uh, and one of the questions, one of the potential sources of uh, noise here is if it's falling off early, uh, is that also adding the untemplated cytosines, which you're then targeting, and then kind of cutting your messenger RNA short? But once you've targeted those untemplated cytosines with your known sequence adapter that has the the five the the overhang with the uh, guanines on, the uh, reverse transcriptase that has this activity can jump back on and make a complement to the all known sequence, which you can then target for second strand synthesis. And this is another potential source of uh, biological noise that we were studying, of uh, technical noise that we were studying. Uh, if the uh, DNA polymerase can fall off early, is that then going to bring some five prime? Uh, bias. So then hopefully we have our double-stranded uh, cDNA and then it's tagmentation in single-cell RNA-seq which is making use of these transposases uh, that have uh, sequencing adapters uh, on the enzyme and they can randomly cut throughout the double-stranded cDNA and add the adapters that you can target for uh, the uh, amplification and uh, processing for the, uh, in this case, Illumina sequencing. So you then have your fragmented cDNA with hopefully uh, one pair of uh, your adapters. And a potential problem here is if you have two of one type of adapter, then you will lose that in the subsequent uh, PCR amplification, which again brings some, some noise uh, through the amplification steps. But also uh, a potential problem with an exterior and transposase mediated stuff is that you can lose the three prime and five prime most ends because they won't have adapters added on either. So you tend to lose those. But one of the, the very useful things about this is that it means you don't have to do any uh, fragmentation before, so before uh, reverse transcription. And it means you're not trying to do lots of processing steps. So it's just about the best protocol for uh, single cell sequencing because it reduces loss. So trying to look at the technical noise here, uh, we developed, um, and it's in the paper, the, the Star Trek plots, so named because when you look at a standard sequencing uh, run that's been 
generated using the, the SMART method. You get a quite a bit of a three prime bias, and it creates a shadow that looks a bit like the uh, Star Trek uh, communicator badge. So this is our, the heat map that is the Star Trek plot, and the three prime position of the transcript is on the right, five prime position is on the left, and the shortest transcripts are at the top of the map. So this just lets us quickly glance at different protocols and different titrations of temperature and reagents and see how it, how it affects the sequencing data that we're getting back. And then Dan and Vahid in the paper did a lot of uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, modeling and it suggested that by decreasing the temperature we should be able to increase the processivity of the enzymes so the length of time that the reverse transcriptase and the uh, DNA polymerase are in contact with the molecule and so we should be able to increase the bias, uh, we should be able to increase uh, the coverage that we get and shift the bias. So there's some other sources of technical noise that we come across a lot, especially more so with single cell sequencing, which is just the reagent and pipette variation during sample prep, which can affect the primer, salt, uh, and enzyme uh, quantity in the reactions, as well as just the lysis efficiency, uh, efficacy when you're setting up your uh, plates that in our case we were sorting into with a uh, fax machine. And then enzymes also have their own inherent biological uh, bias. Um, these can often be seen as before or against GC. So just looking at some of the uh, differences that we were able to get out of the SmartSeq protocol, by reducing the first and second strand synthesis temperatures, we can, we can see the shift in the bias. Uh, and then newer methods, newer versions of the SmartSeq protocol, I think there's SmartSeq 2 now, uh, such as the addition of betaine can shift the bias again. You see it start to improve there and even start to get five, five prime bias in some of those cases. So this is just a point of interest. It's also a figure from the, the paper where we looked at a few different methods from um, GEO and then later on in the paper we also did quite a few of our own samples. So random priming there really is the golden standard of getting uh, Good, decent coverage across the, the transcriptome, but you can't really do that in single cells because uh, you then have to try, find a way to remove the ribosomal RNA, otherwise it's going to drown out your messenger RNA. So uh, that would, that's the ideal uh, scenario to be in when you're looking at these plots, but it's not really possible to just use random hexamer priming in single cell data because it would be very a very lossy protocol. And the cell sec there doesn't look too great. It's got quite a uh, strong free prime bias. But that doesn't mean it's useless at all because uh, if you're just interested in identifying transcripts in cells, this would actually be a great method to use because it's very quick, very high throughput, and you'll get enough information from that just to identify uh, what transcripts you're looking at. So the biggest thing I took away from this data is just trying to take a step back and see and, and know what data you want to get out of your cells before you start your uh, sequencing e experiment. So our modifications to the SmartSeq uh, protocol was to drop the first and second strand synthesis temperature and you can see the direct comparison there. I think this uh, was exactly with um, single cells uh, sorted from facts, so they're already quite stressed, they're not having a great time, but we did find that we could improve uh, the, the coverage by dropping the first and second strand synthesis temperature, which was suggested by our modeling in the paper. But also, um, this actually worked really well with some of the cycling you see in the SmartSeq2 protocol, where having that high uh, second strand synthesis temperature then dips below for the majority of the time to our lower temperature, it means you get the best of the uh, sol resolving those RNA secondary structures and then uh, dipping down to a low temperature to get the best of the increased processivity from the lower temperatures. So something that I found while just doing the experiments for this paper was that our cost and pipetting were shooting up because we didn't have an automa uh, automated way of doing this at the time. And uh, the consistency between cells, between uh, pipetting was dropping, even just holding uh, the pipette would heat it up and change the volume that I was pipetting when I was trying to keep uh, reagent volume really low. So um, I've been playing a lot with the automation and the mantis now, uh, and it's been saving time, which is probably one of the biggest money savers, is it's not uh, both mine and a PhD student's time just uh, spent on the, on the uh, 
uh, at the bench just pipetting, but it also means that we can scale down the reaction. So I've had cDNA back from one to two microliters, but it works quite well and consistently between two and five microliter uh, final reaction volumes. And that's um, at worst about half of what I've seen elsewhere in the reaction volume, but at best it's um, I get about 10 times better than 10 times smaller volume than I've seen in lots of other protocols. And just reducing the petting time error, variation of volume, um, especially time, I think that's the biggest uh, benefit I've had so far. And so the reason I'm enjoying the Mantis uh, is because it's allowing uh, lots of titrations because it's got easy ways of making gradients in these tiny 100 nanoliter uh, increments uh, between different wells, which is uh, handy when I'm trying to titrate reagents and uh, temperature in, in the same uh, across the same plate. Um, it's also been very quick to swap between people and protocols. Uh, so other automatic or automated uh, machines that I've used spend a lot of time training to where the reagents are now located between different people and different protocols. So it's just uh, take a plate from the fax machine, stick it on the Mantis, and it's pretty much ready to go after a bit of drag and dropping. So I'm hoping that uh, in the next in the near future, uh, we can create bioinformatics tool set for out of our lab based on the, the bias collection in the paper um, and based on the MCMC modeling that um, Fahid and Dan did. Uh, so that can help with data that's already been created uh, and help for bias correction during the bioinformatics steps. But more automation would be great uh, to reduce variation, but also there's a lot of new virtual transcriptases coming on the market, so I'm hoping that there'll be some interesting changes to how they process the RNA. Uh, so variations in the reverse transcriptase activity at various different temperatures would be very interesting. And any protocols that need fewer interactions with the RNA and cDNA would be absolutely fantastic. So uh, just take a, a st step back very quickly what I've, uh, what I think to bear in mind is you need to know what you need to know before going in to the uh, first what you want to do, especially with single cell RNA seq, because it's not a uh, black box of sequencing data yet. You can't just put cells in and get data out that you, you need. So if you want to look for something like alternative splicing isoforms, you probably uh, that limits your options more than if you just want to pull out uh, all the three prime ends and identify which transcripts are there. So also bear in mind that just to have a tinker and titrate different uh, protocols, because uh, you may well get better results from following the non-standard protocols, and in our case, this was looking at the the differences in processivity by temperatures. I didn't really touch on it much, but lots of quality control of your sample, the RNA and cDNA level, just made the sequencing runs go a lot smoother for me. So that's it, really. Uh, so this is our, our lab group. I'm the long-haired one at the back. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, Nathan, for uh, for sharing all of your expertise with us today. It's truly fascinating work that um, you and your colleagues are doing at the University of Warwick.